Good evening. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry. We're here for our Thursday night prophetic gathering with Apostle Don Madison. One of the goals of this meeting is to sh demonstrate the wisdom of God when Jesus sent them out two by two. He didn't send his men out in the <coughs> pursuit or under the constraints of a corporate infrastructure, hierarchical in nature, uh, with uh, somebody up at the top and then various roles and functions ascending down in a pyramid scale that so defines leadership structures today in the secular world and has been adopted uh, almost universally by the church. Somebody said anything with two heads is a freak. Mm -hmm. But what you don't get, the people that think like that, is Jesus is the head. And as we come together according to Psalm 133, there's an anointing that runs down the beard, even Aaron's beard. So we're talking about maturity. You want to see greater anointing? You want to experience greater anointing? You have to leverage yourself into a greater maturity, and it takes greater maturity to have a level of relationship to dwell together in unity. You know, we can come together um, for a community-wide evangelism initiative, and then everybody divides back up into their thing. We can come together in a conference. We can have a, a, a moment of unity. And you say, well, wasn't that great? Well, whatever happens in those settings, and, and many things are done and experienced, but there's something called brethren dwelling together in unity. Amen. Because Jesus is not interested in just visitation. He'll take what he can get, but he's looking for habitation. And just as he prayed in his great intercessory prayer in John 17, mm -hmm. he said, Father, I pray that they would be one with each other, that they may be one with us. I always thought it was the other way around. Let's get close to God so that I can put up with all these people I don't agree with. <laughs> no. Jesus said, let them become one because he will not live in a divided house. Amen. How do we become one? We live together. We have all these constraints and all these structures. We use academic structures. We use corporate structures from the business world. We use traditional religious structures going back hundreds of years to define the expression of our pursuit of the kingdom. But it's very holistic. Look what Jesus did. He hung out with those guys. Can you imagine Jesus? healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out devils, fielding questions from James and John's uh, mother about who's going to be the greatest. Now, Mama, you know that's not mine to give. <laughs> and he smiles. And here's Peter and James out there uh, beyond the campfire, found a dead cat, and they drug him out into the rocks. Be healed in the name of Jesus! Be healed in the name of Jesus! Such a safe learning environment. And it was, they, they dwelled together. You can't do that at arm's length. You can't do that with black rubber gloves and a white lab coat. You have to come into a place. And I feel the fear of God every time I say this. You have to come into the place that you embrace the benchmark of God's love. That says, as he says to us, we say one to another, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Amen. The only way that happens is if we fall in love with his word. So we need to love each other. No, we need to love his word. Amen. Because the scripture says, why do we not dwell together? Why do we split relationships? Because of offense. And the, the, the psalmist tells us that great peace of those who love thy word they shall in nothing be offended. I know I apply that my, to myself when I, when I feel that offense coming on. And my first conversation with God, say, well, I guess 
in this instance, I do not love the word. Because the word is a two-edged sword. Church culture is not the two-edged sword. God is not face forward with church culture to win the world. It's his word. The foolishness of preaching brings online redemptive reality that people can move by demonstration of power. And that first thing, they'll know. What are they going to know? They know a lot of things about us. <laughs> but he said, they'll know your mind by your love one for another. And it is a love defined. It's not teeth grit and love, but it is a love to find that looks at your brother and your sister and says, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. That is not the experience of the church. Churches, when they talk about shifting memberships, you know what the word they use? They call it churn. You may never hear that. But I grew up in pastoral culture behind the doors where you will never go. And from the largest churches to the smallest churches, they talk about churn. That's people that come in and go out. And the, and the turnaround time, how long they're with you. Uh, that's actually a, a term used in the cell phone business. I was in the cell phone business for a lot of years. And uh, we had something called churn. People that would come in and take us up on our offer of uh, what we were offering in our cell phone. And then before we could really see the profit come to the company, they were shifting out. That is not, God has not called us to be vagabonds. He has not called us to be wandering stars, clouds without water. He has so much more for us. There is a dimension of the kingdom imbued with his power, invested with an out, what the word glory means, an outraying of the divine yeah. to detonate on the earth and change us and change our culture. So, this is a two by two proposition. First apostles, secondarily prophets. This is Russ Walden and Apostle Don Madison ministering out of our weekly prophetic gathering with our staffs, volunteers to our ministry and friends that come to participate with us. We have about an hour that we spend together with testimony and worship and then we uh, transition over to doing this. And so, Don, I'd like to turn this over to you. Praise the Lord. It's, uh, it's a joy being here with Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus in his body. And uh, the Lord has given me <clears throat> some things this, this afternoon that related to what we, the songs that were going ahead. Not, you haven't heard them, but uh, out there. But we've we, uh, heard some music that was a heavenly music. And, and it, it's like a person that goes into the glory and he was sharing and ministering out of that glory that he was in. And uh, this relates directly to what it was going on. So it, it kind of confirmed to me that, that God was saying, what, what I've given you is something that I'm giving to the body tonight. And uh, what I, uh, I begin with, uh, is what I call insight to exploration. You know, man is a, an exploratory person, uh, exploring different avenues. I mean, all we see is, as far as what's, what's happened on the earth, and even uh, the things that are lightning, uh, light, uh, uh, light bulbs, uh, cars, and all of this is a point of, uh, and all of the technology that we enjoy today uh, actually came out of someone that was exploring areas of uh, reality, of his reality. Uh, and it's more than, uh, than, than just Christian, uh, than Christians because uh, who invented the car? And yet we drive around in them. And yet uh, chances are 
that the person that invented the automobile was not even a, what, we, what we would call a Christian. But he had within him the exploration into different arenas. And uh, we drive in them today. And we uh, are over the internet. Who invented the internet? Al Gore. Al Gore. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, when we get the insight into the exploration of heaven, of the, of the eternal realm, that's where we're going tonight. And we've been experiencing some of that already. Uh, I'd like to start out with a, with a, a psalm, which is 51.6. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts. We're talking about God's desire. Truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden part, you will make me know wisdom. Hidden. Hidden parts. Hidden truth. Uh, the uh, truth comes to those that desire truth, that have a hunger for truth. Hunger creates desire that, that God manifests that particular aspect of his hunger. God is looking for hungry souls to grow. And uh, truth in the in inward parts for God's offspring. We are God's offspring. That means we're part of the family. Just as much as your child is uh, that you've had, some of you ladies... And, and, and you, you've had children. They're part of you. They're part of your family. They were developed within you before they became manifested outside of you into the world. And it's, uh, that's what God does at work within us before he, he allows us to manifest those, that very work itself because the work is more than just a doctrinal idea about the work. Work is the substance of things that are expected. Work is substantial. God works in and we work out. We work out what God works in. The word says God works in us both to will and to do his good pleasure. I mean, we're talking about God working out of a material, of a, a vessel of human beings. God working out. That means that God, in order for him to work out, he's got to be in. And what he works in, we work out to do his good pleasure. His statutes are the highways to God. The highways, the, the ways of traveling in the realm of the Spirit of God. The, way, the realm of seeking lands of truth that God would give you. God gives us truth in the inward parts. He gives us truth in the inward parts so it can be manifested to the outward parts. That's why we need a body. When we're talking about Jesus, we're not talking about uh, a historical figure, who he was, but we're talking about someone that lives in his body and is just as valid as if he was living here by himself. Because he, he, this is what he has done. He has manifested himself. And when he manifests himself, he imparts what he manifests. And we, uh, we get a chance, we have an opportunity to uh, embrace it and understand it. And that we're not speaking, our, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracle of God. The oracle means the mouthpiece of God. How can you speak as the mouth, mouthpiece of the Almighty? That's what you call prophecy. Amen. When you're speaking as a prophet, you're speaking a manifestation out of the gift that God has given to you. Uh, the family traits of heaven is involved here because we're not only dwelling on the earth, we also dwell in heaven and earth at the same time. God's family tree. God, where, where do we find God's family tree? In the Lamb's book of life. 
the Lamb's book of life, those that have been purchased by the, by the blood of the Lamb. When you're purchased and you receive blood, you're receiving the very life of the one who gave it. The substance of life is in the blood. The living of life is in the blood. The motive involving within the life is in the blood. And this is what was given to us. The, the, and we, we, he has written through his blood in his lamb, the Lamb's book of life. We're in his book. This is the house of God. We are the house of God. We are the body and members in particular. Now, a lot of us have heard these things, but, but hearing it with a, let's say, uh, of one kind of an ear, well, that's good, that's good doctrine, and so forth and so on. But when you hear it, and you hear it in the Spirit, you embrace what you hear. It becomes more than words. It becomes a living word. It becomes a substance that is there to live out of each one of us. It's to be, uh, we, we feel, we move in the material realm, but we take the things of the eternal realm, the, and we manifest them into the material realm, and that's the substance of faith. The faith is a substance of things that are expected, and the evidence of things, what? Unseen. Faith comes from the glory. Faith comes from heaven. Amen. These, what, what remains? Faith, hope, and love. These three remain. We fill all realms. In Ephesians 4, 10, and 11, he says, He who has descended is also the one who has, has ascended far above all heavens that he might fill all things. Now, who's he going to fill it with? Hello. And he himself gave some apostles. That's who he's fill, That's who he fills the realms of glory that he's ascended to. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Man has been given the characteristics of exploration, the exploration of the sun. He came and explored life as a man. And then he took man into exploration of glory. And that's us tonight. Amen. We're here, but we're there too. Glory. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> to explore everything that is explorable and fill it. We're not, we just don't enter into something and say get a little, little tidbit of it, but we're there to fill it. We have the substance of life that fills yeah. every part that God would give, it, give us and manifest it. It's not enough to just sit and listen. It's enough to lay hold of and begin to move in the, in the realm in which God is speaking to us within. Amen. Because we've got within our bodies, we've, we've, got the, the, we've got the apostolic, we've got the prophetic, We've got the evangelistic, we've got the pastoral, and we've got the teacher. We've got all of these realms to explore everything that's explorable and fill it in heaven and earth. As he is, so are we on the earth. As he is, so are we on the earth. 1 Corinthians 15, 25 through 28, for, for, for he must reign till he has put all enemies mm -hmm. under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Amen. Uh, we're talking about those things that were, were uh, uh, put upon man through the disobedience of Adam, first of all. Mm -hmm. And it was given to... And the nature became the nature of our flesh. We didn't decide to have the realm of the flesh. It was given to us at birth. Mm -hmm. just, like, uh, just like we've been given the, 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 the nature of God. 
in the, uh, through the realm of faith and promise. You see, and, and, and God has given us many great promises that by these will what? Inherit the divine nature. That's how we, promises is how, we, and obtaining promises is how we inherit the divine nature. The nature, the divine nature is the nature of God himself. Right. And you're talking about not just the, the nature of someone, you're talking about the nature of someone becoming you. I mean, how good is that? Awesome. Taking people that were hopelessly lost, I'm talking about me, I'm and talking I'm talking about, about you. you. I'm talking to you. <laughs> you talking <laughs> yes, to you're talking to me. <laughs> yeah, I'm talking to you. We were. We're all lost and, and without and undone and, and without hope in this world yeah. until Jesus came, until the Holy Spirit came oh, yeah. and manifested Jesus to us, and we became a son of God based in the reality that God, uh, 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 God's love, which was based in the blood of his son. Yeah. If somebody gives their life for me and spills their blood, how much do I owe that person? Mm -hmm. That's why, uh, you know, our military should uh, yeah. really be honored. Amen. Because they, they, were <laughs> Amen. they were in there for somebody. <laughs> They, were, they put their lives in danger, and many of them lost their lives to protect their families at home. We didn't have to go. But what a value that we must place on a life that, was, that took our place. And that's the value that we place in Jesus. He took our place on the cross. We deserve death. Right. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> Amen. A few more things. A pattern of God's work. What is the pattern? There's a pattern that God weaves. <clears throat> A pattern that God is weaving in your life. There's a pattern. It's like a, an artist that, or that somebody that weaves a pattern in a piece of cloth. A pattern. And so, let's look at it for a moment. God's work works in me. I work what God works in. In all diligence, redeeming the time. In other words, that we begin to accept responsibility of those things that God has given to us. Yeah. And we all have the response, the ability to respond to what God is saying to us. Can we respond tonight? Can we respond out there to what God has laid before us? with redeeming the time, the work of buying back redemption, buying back redemption with our life. The redemption, we're talking about the redemption was the cost of the blood. We were redeemed by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony of what the blood did. The word of testimony and that which is given, it moves one after, out of the other. Testimony is given. That means that, that we were there when it happened. And we put ourselves in that particular place. That's a witness. A witness. I eat uh, the will of him who sent me. That's my my food. I eat the will. Mm. I, because I'm given living bread. You know, we take communion and we eat bread and we drink wine or grape juice, one of the two. But what are we doing when we're doing that? 
you see. We're eating him. We're eating the will of God. I eat the will of him that sent me. I am here in Arizona. I represent him that sent me. I represent Jesus here. Amen. We all here are here because we're sent here. We've been sent here. Yes. And we're representing him where we're sent. Uh -huh. In the authority that he has given us in himself. We are the representation of of the kingdom of God. I represent him that sent me. I live in time and bring back the products of eternity into time. Amen. Because I'm more, I live more than sitting on the face of the, uh, you know, on, the, on the earth. I live in heaven and I live on earth. Because he lives in heaven and lives on earth in us. We're living in heaven in him. Now I could give you many scriptures that, uh, that, uh, that substantiate what I'm talking about. The word says on earth as it is in heaven. Eternity. Heaven is eternity. It's not part of time. In him who is eternal life. My world is an orderly arrangement of a limitless eternity. Limitless. In time, in time working in what looks like a capacity into a seedbed of multiplied potential. When, you're, when you receive a word from God, you receive something that is a planting of the Lord. And one seed, if you're just looking at the natural, you put a seed. How many fields of wheat does one grain of wheat have within it? How many fields of wheat is in one grain? It's innumerable. As it's, as it's planted in the good ground. Mm -hmm. And when, when, the seed, when the seed that's planted in you, that eternal life seed, has innumerable, limitless potentiality to reproduce what God has put within you. Amen. Both in terms of, of your, uh, your stature in God and then also your ability to reach in and touch people's lives with the promises of God that are yes and amen to them that believe. <laughs> Bearing the fruit unto eternal life. Excuse me. In seed is unlimited increase. You know, uh, Kathy, in your, uh, in your office, and what you have seen, what you have, s s the seeds that you have sown, they're eternal seeds that are limitless. There is no limit. You see, to the seed that you planted, it might have, it might have been very simple. Just to, and and uh, uh, brother Vic, the same. You know, the people that you you reach out to every day. I mean, I have been I, I've gone into restaurants with him, and he's just waiting for somebody for an inclination. <laughs> uh, we went to a, a restaurant the other day together, and he took me out to to lunch. And the people next to where we were sitting in the, in the booth were singing happy birthday to somebody. Well, guess what? Vic found out who the somebody was. And he began to set up a conversation with them, and, which led to a, a witness Amen. and ministry to those people. And they loved it.
They loved it. It made their day. <laughs> and I've seen him do it over and over again. Amen. <laughs> we are his living, seed living in, in the eternal seed of the Father. Who is the eternal seed of the Father? Jesus. He is. And what seed produces Jesus is seed like unto him. In every sense of the word. We are his seed living in the, in the eternal seed of the Father, which is Jesus Christ. Our King of kings and Lord of lords, to him be glory forever. Amen. Amen. Take it to the bank. Awesome <laughs> glory to God. Awesome <laughs> the Apostle Peter said that we were born again of the incorruptible seed. Yeah. E.W. Kenyon picked up on that and wrote a book called The Reality of Redemption. That his, his point that he made in that book is that we are not just accounted as God's children, but that we have been his, he used the term forensically born again. That we have in reality and in truth something of substance happened to us that Jesus referred to unless you're born again. And if we're going to be born again, we have to understand our status as God's children. Paul said, all things are new. Old things are passed away. He called Jesus two things. He called him the second Adam and the last man. Mm -hmm. In other words, in Christ, the Adamic race was concluded as far as God was concerned. And every person born after the sin nature of Adam from the, de from the moment he said it is finished, every person born in sin after that was completely unnecessary. He intended to deal with sin by the sacrifice of himself. And so when the scriptures talk about we've received the adoption of sons, that is not adoption like we think. Mm -hmm. We think of that as God's merciful. Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a sinful person. I acknowledge it. Uh, God forgives me. Uh, he has a he has a ongoing extension of forgiveness out to me, and on that basis, He has adopted me. I I am a child of Satan, born in sin, but now I have been adopted in, and that is completely false, because the scriptures that talk about Adoption, it's a Greek word pronounced oios. And it means to be set as a son. And how that worked was, and it explains something about Jesus thinking as a child, the oios was what took place when a father, like Joseph, would have taken Jesus at the age of 12, having learned everything his father could teach him about the family business. He would take Jesus out into the marketplace, and every father would do this. He would take his son out where the vendors and clients were that he did business with, and he would lay his hands on that son, and he would cry out with a loud voice, this is my beloved son, hear ye him. 
And from that moment forward, everything that that son in did became as effective as if the father said it or mm -hmm. did it. And oh, that's yeah. what it means. We're, we're not adopted institutionally. God's overlooking mm -hmm. that fact that we're really children of Satan. Mm -hmm. No. We've been born again of the incorruptible oh, seed. seed. We are oh, new yeah. creatures in Christ Jesus. Yeah. The law is our schoolmaster, mm -hmm. our tutor, and our governor mm -hmm. to bring us to Christ, to bring us to maturity to where we experience and there are many people that have experienced what they call a third definite work of grace where they have, they have felt a shift at a certain point I remember as a young man I, I gave my life to God when I was six I was baptized in the Holy Ghost when I was 12 but when I was 18 something happened to me and it happened to me overnight I went from struggling with worldly appetites, sinful desires, and literally overnight I woke up the next morning, I lost all interest in the music I was listening to. Amen. And music was a huge part of my life. Uh, rock and roll, and I'm not just talking about bubblegum, pop music, some pretty dark stuff. Mm -hmm. That uh, And just so many things. The girlfriend that I loved, I had every intention of marrying her. And if I hadn't got right with God, we would have married. We'd have made good heathens. <laughs> <laughs> because we were completely compatible as heathens. But then she got born again. I gave my, rededicated my life to Christ, and that whole relationship evaporated to the glory of God and the credit to His grace. Amen. And, and I felt that churning. I asked my father about it, and he reminded me when Jesus told Peter, when you're converted. Mm -hmm. He had already breathed on him, said to receive the Holy Ghost. He had already promised them the outpouring of the, of the Holy Spirit, which is more than what they got when he breathed on them. They got born again when he breathed on them. They got the baptism of what they, he breathed on them. He just hit them with a water balloon when he breathed on them. <laughs> and then they got baptized. But then there was something else out there. And the Bible calls that in various places the manifestation of the sons of God. Yeah. Uh, the, to be set as a son, the adjudication of the saints, the redemption of the purchased possession, the baptism of fire mm -hmm. that we've taught on extensively. And, and that has implications for who we are. We are God carriers in the earth. And as such... When we step out into our day, see, Satan is a prince. He's not a king. That's right. <coughs> Amen. We are kings. Mm -hmm. Kings have authority over princes. Mm -hmm. and we, we can elaborate on that further. But uh, that's why it says he goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour or who he can devour didn't say he he will see it's who he can who he may doesn't mean he will because where believers are in tow I, I know for myself the greatest authority I have seen in my life is when I walk into a situation and a demon manifests and I don't get out my 12-point deliverance <laughs> stuff. <laughs> I walk in, the demon manifests. I've, seen, I've walked in and seen death on a, on a woman. Sitting in a church meeting, I saw death. It looked like she was wearing a shroud, black shroud, but I knew she wasn't. And I was moving in an authority, and I had really good 
uh, ministry team and people were screaming out. God was really moving in that moment. And I raised my voice, bring that woman to me. And I knew who she was. And uh, I said, I see that spirit of death on you. And they brought her up to me. And she, they brought her up to me. She, she began to scream, no, no. I said, you come out of her. Shut up and come out. And she hit the floor and got up looking like an angel. If that's not what you're experiencing with the demonic, there's a couple of reasons why. It's above your pay grade. <laughs> your life isn't right. Uh, they are not ready. Most difficult cases where for the... Normally, I will not deal with a demonic situation. If it doesn't manifest in my presence, I'm not interested because I don't dance with devils. But there have been times because I have a love relationship and I know somebody's having a problem. When I, when I deal with them, the big thing I find out, like Kitty says, God will deliver you from your enemies. He will not deliver you from your friend. Yep. <laughs> and many, many times I've counseled people and, and the demon can't lie. He comes from the father of lies, but in your presence... He knows he's answering to somebody with a higher rank. And there's a hidden sin somewhere. And you just go from there. We need to be careful. I know a ministry Kitty and I got exposed to, a good friend of ours, flew from Missouri to the, the West Coast to go to this guy's home for a weekend with a team of like 30 people who were going to get this kid cast out his demons. He came back, looked like they had run over him with a spiritual dump truck. He was more broken. I've never seen this guy more, one of the worst situations I've ever seen. They didn't help him. But here's how the guy functions. He, he will pitch his, his, his gestalt, his shtick, to a group of people like this and he plays recordings of interviews with demon-possessed people. And he'll stop, he'll pause it, and, and he quotes scripture, and he says this, and he says that, and he's, he's selling them on the validity of what he's doing. And he's using this interview with this demon-possessed uh, person. I leaned over to Kitty. I said, you know what the Bible calls that? That's doctrines of demons. Mm -hmm. He's based his entire methodology, not on what God's Word says, but on what those demons are saying. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's salacious. There's something in us. We want hidden knowledge, occult knowledge, just like the, the love of money, root of all evil. If you look at the proper translation, it means the desire to shine. And we need to be real careful with that because distinction in the body of Christ is not ego-based. Mm -hmm. It's very sobering. But it's about knowing who you are. You are a king. Kings have kingdoms. You have a jurisdiction. Some of that's really obvious. Family members, husbands and wives, children, People that blame you. The only people that you normally don't have any authority over, but then suddenly you do, is the ones that blame you. I used to eat my lunch when people would blame me. And then God showed me in the scriptures. He said, let me show you how I made Moses a God to Pharaoh. He told Moses, I'll make you a God to Pharaoh. You know how he did it? <coughs> Pharaoh said, this is all your fault, Moses. He blamed and the scripture says when you do that, when you do not forgive, you're turned over to the tormentor who turns you over to the officer who puts you in the prison and you don't come out till you pay the uttermost farthing. And so when you don't forgive, the person you are not forgiving becomes a de facto God in your life and whatever they want to happen in your life is going to come to pass. 
That's why when it happens to you and you start getting blamed, you better know one of the greatest tests you'll ever go through. Bless him, Lord, with a brick! No. No. <laughs> you can't do that. You, you have to pray, God, bless them away from me. I, I forgive, I release, I bless. Amen. I've had people, man, I had a relationship to a guy. He was uh, homeless when I met him. He had two pairs of pants and one shirt. I brought him into the church. He had an anointing on his life. I raised him up. He became a deacon in my church. He became an elder in my church. And then he became an insurrectionist in my church. <laughs> and so, following the leadership of the Holy Spirit, bless your enemy. I met with the board of directors, and we leveraged a large part of our budget to launch his church. Just like Lot, Abraham blessed him away from him. And he went out and built what is to this day the most influential church in that, in that county. But his heart was, and he announced it openly, he said, everything that Russ thinks God has given him belongs to me. And I want this whole church to come together. We're going to intercede until God removes Russ and gives everything that he has to me because it's mine. And he did all kinds of things, very ugly things. And he was very close to my family. He was, he was a very intimate friend. And he, he knew how to really create problems in my family. And uh, <laughs> uh, eventually, the, the connection just kind of lapsed. And every time I'd see him, usually about every three years I'd run into him, it literally felt like somebody kicked me in the belly. And then one day he got in trouble because it's easy to get people to rebel. It's hard to get them to stop. And so the people he, he stole out of our congregation rebelled against him and did to him what he had done to me, only 10 times worse. They took his home. They literally in a day made his wife and himself homeless. And they reached out to anybody that knew him. You have to make him suffer. He's supposed to be a street urchin. We don't want him. So he'd put all that cruelty in them toward me, and it manifested in his own life. And he calls me up, sobbing, I, I need to see you. And I said, okay. And I was driving over there. God says, I've delivered your enemy into your hands. He had been telling me for about eight years he was going to do it. He said, what are you going to do about it? I drove a little wise and had some scenarios I was working through. And I said, God, I'm going to love him. And God said, just checking. When Kitty and I first started our ministry, we had very influential people in the city of Springfield and in Branson who assassinated our characters, spoke against us, did everything they could to vilify us. And uh, we had to walk in love. Amen. We knew we couldn't have the next thing that God had for us unless we walked in love. Amen. But part of walking in love is walking in authority. And you can't walk in that level of authority until you know the word. You know, the, what is it uh, Daniel said? Um, Those that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Yeah. If we're not doing exploits, it's because we're not strong. Let the word be the discerner. When it talks about Jesus in Hebrews 4 being our high priest, it's in the context of him being the discerner yeah. as the living word. Think about it. You, the priest would lay hands on the offering and on the offerer. I guarantee you he was discerning some stuff. 
And he says, they that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. If we're not doing exploits, it's because we're not strong. And if we're not strong, it's because we don't know our God. And the first part of that verse says what we, the only thing we could turn to, he says, such as do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupt by flatteries, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. So, if we're not doing exploits, if you let the word be the discerner, let the word discern, like, great peace have they who love thy word, they shall in nothing be offended. I don't love your word today, Father. Please forgive me. Because my offense tells me. My offense discerns me through the scripture. So if I'm not doing exploit, it's, it's because I'm not strong. If I'm not strong, it's because I don't know my God. And if I don't know my God, it's because I've allowed myself to be corrupt by flatteries. I've, I've listened to my own press releases. I've become a legend in my own mind. And the narcissism that has swept the last few generations of the Western world has just completely bulldozed whole generations. They've told them how great they are, how wonderful they are, and they're committing suicide at an appalling rate because they can't live up to the law. So they're corrupt by flatteries. Why are they corrupt by flatteries? Because they did wickedly against the covenant. What's the covenant? It's the covenant of Abraham. It's the covenant that Jesus made on the cross. What is the covenant that Jesus made on the cross? 1 Corinthians 1.30 says that God, in the work of Calvary, God made Jesus to be our righteousness. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm trying to do, if I'm doing something related to that covenant, I'm doing wickedly. It's not about, I enter into that covenant not by what I did, but by what Jesus did. That's why when Abraham cut that covenant in Genesis 14, a smoking furnace came down and said, lay the pieces out and caused Abraham to swoon and only be a witness to what was a known covenant. It was a covenant was very well defined in those days. What Abraham witnessed was a unilateral covenant of the, his covenant partner. They said that furnace was a pre-cross manifestation of the resurrected Jesus. And it was Jesus in his glory came and passed between the pieces. Usually they'd pass between the pieces arm in arm of these animals ripped open and put in a figure eight and they would pass between the pieces and, and recite in unison, thus do God to me and more besides if I keep not all the words of this covenant. Mm. But the other, this covenant that Abraham made, God made him merely a witness. He swoons and Jesus himself comes down and says, thus do God to me and more besides if I fulfill not all the conditions of this covenant. And in that very moment, he took on him, himself Abraham's sins that constituted him a sinner. Mm -hmm. Constituted him laden with Abraham's sin. Yeah. And in the eyes of God's justice, though he was pure and clean, he carried that stain of sin. Because in a covenant, if, if Vic and I are in covenant... Everything Vic has belongs to me. Everything I have belongs to Vic. I'm not giving it to him. It is his. Amen. I can reach in his pocket and take his keys. I can go to his house and pick up his checkbook. I can send all of my relatives that I don't want to put up in my house over to his house. <laughs> That's the kind of covenant it is. Wow. See. See, the, the scripture says that w in Ephesians that we were holy and without blame before him in love before the foundation of the world. Yes. Religious legalism and apostasy do not understand the difference. So he said he's made us accepted in the beloved. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between God's acceptance and God's approval. 
God accepts us going back to before the foundation of the world when the sons of God sang for joy. We were in the choir when God was laying the foundation of the earth according to Job. And we were singing. And while God was working, laying the foundation of the world, he's singing mm. back to us and telling us, we are, you are accepted in the beloved. I call you my children. And then when we get into this earth experience, that acceptance follows us and comes into connection with approval. That scri scripture did not say, you were approved before the foundation of the world because you were not approved before the foundation of the world. You were accepted. Now, that's a really good deal. My children are accepted so they can eat at my table. My children are accepted so they can sleep under my roof. Other children come in here to sleep, I will show them the door. Go home to your mama's calling you. So there's entitlements that accrue to us because he accepts us, and the Bible makes them very clear. But there are also entitlements that have to do with approval. And that's earned. Mm -hmm. And most of the entitlements connected with approval have to do with fulfilling your destiny. Because John, Gene Edwards, who wrote Tale of Three Kings, the first, it's about Saul, David, and, and Absalom. And he starts out with Saul, David, and Absalom as unrealized souls in the compartment in heaven where they would stay before they were sent down to earth. And he read off three destinies and Saul gets up, David gets up, and Absalom gets up and claims their their destiny. And they went out to fulfill what they what they perceived to be their call. And everything that happened there, like David, a man after God's own heart, that's God's approval. Saul, think about it. Samuel had the, uh, I'll close with this, Samuel had the Christ anointing on him when he was in Eli's house saying, speak Lord for thy servant here. And something came on him as a prophet that his words didn't fall to the ground. When he laid hands on Saul, that anointing on him as a prophet that his words didn't fall to the ground was transferred to Saul as a king anointing that caused his enemies to be unable to stand before him. And then he laid hands on David and the anointing left Saul and landed on Jesus. And David, yes. And then came down to Jesus through those bloodlines. Mm -hmm. Approval. The approval of God. And what's the point? Knowing God. Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Yes, amen. I want to know him. David David, he, he, he hijacked the Ark of the Covenant. And instead of taking it to Moriah, he took it to his backyard next to his barbecue grill. <laughs> and he left it open. And he appointed 200 worshipers per square foot to worship the beauty of holiness. And when he said he sat under the shadow of the Almighty, he was under the shadow of the cherubim over the mercy seat. It's like my, my worship leader, uh, when he was a, in, in Catholicism, he so longed, and they have the host that holds the wafers, and they believe the priests teach them God's in there. And my buddy would go there to the Catholic church when nobody else was there, and he would sit down and sing, in moments like these, I sing out a song, I sing out a love song to Jesus. And he would go over to that box and he'd hug it and he'd sob. And he'd say, I want you in here. And he didn't have any evangelical theology. He was longing for God. Knowing him. Mm -hmm. And out of knowing him, we tend to think of mystics as those that know him, the erudite scribes and wise men. No, it's those that when you know him, you're going to do exploits. You're going to stand up as 
God carriers, what, what John G. Lake called God men and God women in the earth. So, Father, we thank you for yes. your thank word. You, yes. We thank you for thank your you truth. We thank you for the multiplication. I speak a release. O tabrembe de steady of new creation reality. Let the new creation mentality purge these minds from every impediment. Let them see through the lens of eternity past that they are accepted. Yes, Lord. And let them turn and embrace the assignment that brings approval. Thank you, Father. Thank you. To break through the boundaries of yes, human Lord. culture. Thank you, Jesus. Thank even you. religion, Father God. Mm. Till we manifest as men and women of God with people longing to be in yes, our presence Lord. that our shadow Thank you, would touch those in need and they'd be instantly delivered. There'll be wheelchairs, Father yes, God, Lord. left in parking lot. That's not a shopping cart. That's a wheelchair. Yeah, they do that all the time. Some people moved into this town a couple months ago. That God, it be a new thing. Minds bound by dementia will come to order and clarity, Father. The ravages of time Thank you. An old age. Thank you, Lord. Turn back. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Signs, miracles, and wonders proceeding out of our knowledge of you. Yes, Lord. Thank you. Because we know you. And you know us. Amen. That you might Amen. discern us. Amen, Lord. Thank and you. as our high priest, put your hand upon us. And transmigrate our transgression. Thank you. That it might be expunged through the filter of the shed blood of Calvary. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Let your fire, God, let it come through this camera. Let it come out to all those that are listening and detonate. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. A footprint you, of visitation. Yes, Lord. Upon your people. Jesus, thank you, Lord. I command limbs to be recovered. I command metal to migrate out of bodies. Those that are wearing devices to, because they're crippled, they'll lay them aside. They'll get up in the morning and walk out of their bedroom, not putting those devices on their body because they've been touched and they've been made whole. Yes, Lord. Lord, you said we don't have to talk about what we demonstrate. We call for a demonstration. We release it through this yes, camera. Lord. Yes, Lord. Let there be a detonation, a release of the demonstration yes. of your power. Amen. Amen. Do it now, Lord. Yes, yes Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. God bless you. We'll be back next Thursday.